the dramatic cat. Hello everybody and welcome to my brand new series. So as some of you may know, my long-term subscribers, I am a massive fan of Japanese art and I'm lucky enough to have a collection of ukiyo-e or uh, Japanese prints that literally translates like pictures of the floating world which is what um, the pleasure quarters of uh, old Tokyo or Edo as it was called um, that's what they were referred to as the floating world because of that kind of transient pleasure that could be found there you know prostitutes um, drinking sake you know all those kind of things those transient transient pleasures we enjoy in real you know in, in everyday life that's what these prints were originally meant to show you know the, the pleasures of life the enjoyment of life but as it went on from the Edo period through to the Meiji period which is kind of the, the Edo period was the heyday of this particular type of art um, it slowly changed and transformed and we get more interesting depictions of um, Chinese folk tales, Japanese folk tales, pictures of beauty or bijou as they're called um, of uh, literally one of the things I find really interesting is that there are um, pictures of uh, barmaids and uh, restaurant waitresses that became famous, the women themselves became famous because of these Japanese uh, artists who made these 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 prints, who painted these pictures that got turned into prints, the Japanese public was so overblown with the beauty that they saw on the, the prints that they actually went to the restaurants in question to meet the women and they became something of celebrities. So I think it's an understatement to say that this is literally one of my favourite subjects. You can probably tell from the enthusiasm in my voice. Um, now these are going to be absolutely unscripted. I'm literally just going to talk um, about the print I've chosen today. And I'm going to start you off with my absolute favourite series and my absolute favourite ukiyo-e artist called Yoshitoshi. Um, now Yoshitoshi is a Meiji-era artist, so he's a artist who um, is one of the last few great ukiyo-e artists. You might know people like Hokusai and uh, Hiroshige. Hokusai uh, very famously made the print of the Great Wave, which is, um, I'll get a picture up in, uh, on here while I'm talking. Um, the Great Wave is an extremely famous picture. It's known throughout the world. It's it's one of those kind of universal images. And it's just off the coast of um, of Edo. And it's this huge wave that's kind of consuming these fishermen who've gone out for to, to go fishing and they're coming back with their catch and then they get whisked away by this huge wave and it shows the power of nature and you know what a force Japan is and how we should always respect nature and these kind of things. Um, but they're representative of the artists in, in the main era, in the Edo period, but uh, Yoshitoshi is particularly interesting because he's not Edo period, he's not 1700s, 1800s, he's more kind of late 1800s, early 1900s. And he, like us dear viewers, was obsessed with the supernatural. He just loved the occult, he absolutely was besotted with it, with ghosts, with demons, with stories of the occult and the strange, he just, he loved all of it. And so, um, his prints are obviously naturally more attractive to me than, than some people. Um, and also, actually that's not true because the world seems to agree with me because his prints demand some of the highest prices that out there. I mean, most of his prints go for the thousands. There are a few that go for the hundreds, but most of them are in the kind of comfortable thousands um, area. So, I want to share with you today the print series Shinke Sanjuro Kaiser which basically translates, most people translate it to new forms of the 36 ghosts. New forms being um, uh, Yoshitoshi's own interpretations of what he thinks the ghosts would look like in the stories. Um, so it's not like new forms as in new ghost stories, they're old ghost stories from Japan um, that he has reinterpreted, he's interpreted his own way and he's displaying to his, um, to his audience what he thinks they look like. Uh, but personally, I'd like to have a little gripe because I don't really agree with the translation. Uh, most people do translate it as 36 ghosts, but I think a better translation is um, odd things, strange things, new forms of the 36 strange things. Because as we're going to find out in this series, pretty much half of these aren't actually ghosts. They're Japanese mythical creatures. So ghost is a completely shit translation, if I'm being completely honest. So let's sweep that under the carpet and just call it 36 strange things. Now... Uh, I want to start with the contents page, which might seem really boring, and it, it sort of is. Uh, there are a couple of interesting things to say about it. First of all, 
the print series was made from 1889 to 1892. And towards the end of that, um, those two dates, 1892, Yoshitoshi was, um, it was seriously ill. He was very, very sick. And so most historians agree, art historians agree, that this contents page you're now looking at was actually made by his students rather than himself. But it, conclude, uh, it includes quite a few motifs that he really, really liked. One of which is these all terminal leaves you can see, which are representative in Japanese culture of, of death. You know, in autumn, um, leaves are falling, everything's kind of dying and going to you know die over in the winter and become new in the spring so obviously this is all about the macabre the the ghost death all these sort of things and so that's what's going on here that's why we have these terminal leaves and you know again they're in colors that kind of um really imbue death black um dark oranges you know a couple of kind of gray colors um and we've also got a cobweb that kind of just insidiously spreads out from the corner of the print. Uh, obviously, that probably doesn't need explaining. <laughs> Cobwebs always associated with kind of the dark, the, the gothic, the macabre. And the, the contents page itself, which just details exactly what these 36 prints are going to be, is worm-eaten. You can see around the edges of it, it's worm-eaten, which is a motif that he keeps throughout the series. Um, and we see that the borders of every print has that kind of almost you know it's been eaten by moths it's been eaten by worms it's so old and raggedy and it's going to reveal these sinister tales that have been sitting in the Japanese uh, collective consciousness for you know, hundreds of years and now we're going to look at them you know that that kind of impression the interesting thing to say about it is um, Japanese prints you can the, most of them will produce hundreds sometimes even thousands of prints and in multiple series the most uh, expensive prints nowadays um, are first editions, a bit like a first edition book, and they command thousands and thousands of pounds for the really famous artists. I mean, for the Hiroshige's and Kukusai's of this world, we're talking 30,000, 50,000, really high, high prices for the most famous prints. Um, and this contents page can vary massively from what one person has to another. Um, in some, the cobweb isn't even visible. In others, it has, it's, it's a kind of a metallic pigment that they use on the cobweb so it comes off as a bit more kind of shiny shimmery and in some the colours are more sort of pastel you know rather than this macabre appearance that really works some of them actually are closer to kind of pastely colours uh, which I think is interesting um, and that's about it for this contents page uh, it, the actual prints obviously I will go into um, as we go on with the series, but that is your introduction today. So, without further ado, over the next few weeks, I will be telling you all about the 36 Strange Things.